Mahalo, Azul, hello. Out of the 7,000 or so languages estimated to be still spoken or signed, only a small proportion has been documented using methods advocated since the launch of that field of linguistics in the 1990s. As an example, ELDP has funded projects for the documentation of about 450 endangered languages since 2003. Given the accelerated loss of traditional ways of life since the mid 20th century, the cultures associated with the languages are disappearing even faster than the languages themselves, thus restricting the scope of documentable genres and semantic domains. In some, variety and diversity are dwindling at an accelerated pace, and there is no chance whatsoever with current models of documentation of achieving the documentation of more than 10% of the remaining non-described languages, given the ratio of academics to languages. Having acknowledged the situation for Amazir languages, on which I've been working for the last 30 years, I have started implementing a different documentation strategy, which I call auto-documentation, and which is distinct not only from standard academic documentation, but also from remote field work or speaker-assisted documentation, crowdsourcing, etc. This talk presents that strategy, which could easily be adapted to other areas and cultures, given a few adjustments. From the Boesian Trilogy to Academic Documentation, as it has been defined in 1998 by Himmelman in his seminal paper, the paradigm hasn't changed. We've gone from texts, grammar and dictionary to grammar, dictionary and recordings accompanied with transcription, glossing and translation. The new methods recently implemented are variations on this type of documentation. Remote field work, crowdsourcing and collaborative documentation are in fact models where speakers are more involved, but the researcher remains at the steering wheel and at the centre of the process, which depends on funding and academic expertise. As for the output, it always includes materials whose standards are adapted to academic purposes, WAVE for prosodic analysis, Elan Flex for software involving writing of an expert type. The model has a history. Academics, mostly non-indigenous, with technical equipment, with funding, with time, aware of the importance of documenting indigenous languages and cultures and or linguistic diversity, document indigenous groups with little agency and no tech equipment. Its assumptions are the following. First, the centrality of literacy. Transcription and annotation are key, and they are used in order to develop indigenous literacy, with the book seen as the ultimate desirable product. The second point is importance of specialized tech skills. Employing speakers for transcription is now current procedure, with tech training viewed as skills transfer that speakers can capitalize on for their employment, CV, etc. As a result, we get a virtuous or not so virtuous sometimes circle where academics document the language with the help of speakers and speakers create revitalization materials with input and help from involved academics for whom this is a good way of giving back what has been collected for purposes of analysis and publication. This is an inherited model from times when indigenous groups had no access to technology. In order to be successful, it necessitates a high ratio of academic to indigenous communities and sustained collaborations. In best cases, it facilitates reconciliation and genuine collaboration. In worst cases, 
it maintains the dependency of population on academics for their linguistic and cultural documentation, it maintains power relationships and role assignment. Documentation is handled by academics and revitalization by speakers. And meanwhile, in the rest of the world, in places other than rich settler colonial countries, languages and cultures are dwindling. Indigenous communities in those developing countries and in autocratic ones face all sorts of obstacles, lack of institutional or governmental support, sometimes downright suppression, war, civil or otherwise, famine, pandemics, lack of attractiveness for researchers, etc. With the present documentation model, they are left to their own devices if no academic decides to document their languages. Those countries are homes to most under-described languages, some of them thriving, others on the verge of disappearance. All of them deserve to be documented, provided other standards are set for documentation that do not depend on relevance for academia, but on the right to preserve and pass on their language and culture to their descendants. For this purpose, I propose an alternative model whose definition is the constitution by speakers or communities of a body of recordings of their own language and culture using methods and tools that do not involve academic institution or funding, NGOs or other external support but are accessible to any speaker or community in their local environment. This implies that the part of documentation that is the creation of materials specifically designed for academic analysis is taken out of the equation. Also, it means that academics accept to lose control over which languages deserve to be documented and which don't, as well as control over the data. What will be documented is what matters to the community and its descendants. If at some point the documentation becomes available to researchers, this is good, but this is not the central aim of auto-documentation, which is centered around speakers and communities themselves. The definition states using methods and tools that do not involve academic institutions or funding, NGOs or other external support. The question is then how to make these methods and tools accessible, how to share expertise in a sustainable way. The other part of the definition, but are accessible to any speaker or community in their local environment, means that there must be adaptation to the local environment for the success of auto-documentation in terms of available tools and also in terms of linguistic and cultural ideologies. I will focus on the area where I have started to disseminate auto-documentation principles, Tamezra, this vast zone in North Africa that you can see on the map. It is home to an indigenous language family called Amazir or Berber. Those languages are spoken in North Africa, Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso. It's a language family that's comparable in internal variation to Romance or Germanic. It has thousands of micro varieties with dialectal clusters forming languages. Most varieties are poorly described or undescribed, and a lot of them are highly endangered. Very few have audio or video documentation. The switch to Arabic is, is accelerating and the loss of traditional ways of life is accelerating as well. So how to reach speakers and communities? First of all, it's important to assess the situation in order to elaborate a strategy to raise awareness about auto-documentation and facilitate it. The facilitating factors are the fact that mobile phones are widely used. There are cyber cafes, production companies, which are filming weddings, inaugurations, etc. There is activism 
Several languages are still thriving dis despite cultural loss, and in sub-Saharan countries at least, there are no repressive monolingual policies. The obstacles, on the other hand, are the conception that Amazigh activists have of Amazigh as a single language and its varieties as dialects which therefore don't need to be documented or maintained as long as one main language survives. There's also a general contempt for rurality and orality and overemphasis on writing where all the prestige lies, the idea that collecting lists of words is enough and the fact that societies are patriarchal and generally enforce a strict interpretation of religious rules concerning filming, recording, especially of women. As you can see on the slide on the upper left corner, the technical environment is very positive for auto documentation. Algerian phone companies offer 4G and Huawei smartphones. On the upper right, you can see a Moroccan production company publicizing its services, and it's obvious that it owns state of the art cameras and has high filming expertise. On the lower left corner, a Tunisian cyber cafe facilitates internet access and DVD burning. On the right, you can see the inside of a cyber cafe in Mali. In some areas, people have already started filming their cultural heritage. This is the case in Kabylie, my region, where there has been a recent boost in YouTube uploads of such videos in the past year or so. Women have started their own channels, first presenting only recipes and then going fully online as influencers. Mrs. Nadia Moussaoui, a teacher and Kabyl activist, is such an example. Her channel, Demazirt Moussaoui, attracts thousands of viewers in just a few hours and is highly praised. But central Kabylie is an exception and many other regions are in dire need of such initiatives especially those regions where cultural pride and activism are not so strong. This is why I started campaigning on social media in 2018 with the aim of removing obstacles to auto-documentation and providing tools and methods for speakers, reaffirming the importance and prestige of oral tradition, raising awareness about variation within Amazigh and empowering speakers. The campaign started with Facebook, which is the most used social medium in North Africa, and Twitter, where a lot of language activists are, then YouTube. Here are a few examples of the campaign. Here on the left, you have a Facebook post explaining why Amazigh or Berber is not a single language. On the right, the list of endangerment diagnostics is given. Here, on the left, there's a post about Tuareg poetry and everything that's lost in translation. And on the right, a post about famine foods and traditional botanical knowledge. I also launched quizzes. And here is a couscous map with the question, what's the main term for couscous in your region? In order to raise awareness about the fact that Amazigh is not a single language and that there is huge variation across the territory. I also post information about projects that are accessible to speakers or should be here at Documentary Festival in Algeria or a call for projects by ENKP. The channel itself was launched in April 2019 in order to host documentaries made by speakers using auto-documentation methods but also to raise awareness about diversity within Amazir, to attract attention on traditional knowledge and practice, and to showcase videos in Amazir languages, because one can find quite a number of videos featuring Amazir people on YouTube, but most of them are dubbed in French or in Arabic or in English, or people are interviewed by an Arabic speaker and they answer in Arabic. Another statement of the channel is that it, it doesn't provide translated subtitles. It's a place where Amazigh speakers hear about their own cultures in their own languages. 
Here is an example of the first animal documentary in Tasahli, the Namazir language spoken in the Babors Mountains east of Kabilia. It's been filmed and edited by Masinissa and Nadia Garoun, who contributed several auto documentation videos to the channel. <laughs> Other actions in this campaign include, but are not limited to, an interview on Amazigh World News about orality, traditional knowledge, variation within Amazigh, intergenerational transmission, as well as the organization of an auto-documentation training course in the last few months, taught with Masinissa Garoun, targeted at speakers from the general public. And crucially, I just launched the Endangered Amazigh Languages website where any Amazigh speaker can find grassroots homemade clips explaining how to document their own language and culture. For lack of time, I cannot go through the contents of each clip, but you can watch them on the website. There are seven of them explaining why it's important to document one's own Amazigh language and how to do that. Here are two small excerpts from clip number five, Saving and Archiving. For medium-term preservation, it's possible to use YouTube without necessarily making the video public. As you can see in the table, private or unlisted videos are not visible to the general public unless you share the link with people. The first video that was uploaded in 2005 is still visible, me at the zoo, but who knows what will happen in 10 or 20 years. Very long rushes cannot be uploaded. The current limit is 128 Geigers or 12 hours per video for a verified account. And in the long term, being dependent on a commercial platform is not a secure option. Other platforms can also be used for data preservation in the medium term. Those are, for instance, Dailymotion, Vimeo, Peertube. But in any case, it is good to be able to rely on oneself. If the Timbuktu manuscripts have survived for centuries, it is because some families have made this their mission. For instance, the Haidara. This should be the case for recordings in Tamazra. In each village, a committee or a family could commit in the long term to the conservation and regular recopy of the video archive and to keeping everything in order for future generations, locally and in a cloud. Solutions are yet to be found and we have to imagine them. Judging by the response from Amazigh speakers, the campaign is sustainable and starting to reach its main goals. Its wider goals will also, I hope, be reached in the midterm, but there is still a major hurdle, archiving. It is here that academia can make a difference and here that communities need support and help. Indeed, for good reasons, Archiving done by national institutions is not a preferred option in non-democratic countries where Amazigh activists are still being imprisoned and killed. This is a point that needs further consideration in collaboration with communities and activists. I hope we can discuss this and other points on the 3rd of March at 9 a.m., for at the paper Q&A session in Zoom room A58. I will also expand on those questions at the plenary I will be giving at the ACAL conference, the African Linguistics Conference, which is taking place between the 8th and the 10th of April. Mahalo, Tenmirth, thank you.